The following program is intended only for mature audiences. All right, now we're going to pull over and park a while tonight on some things. And I'm going to talk to you tonight for a while about America's favorite subject, and this is sex. And what the Bible has to say about it. Now, you're living in a great hypocritical generation. You're living in a generation where nobody tells it like it is. And they say, talk about sex. So what kind of sex? Well, the word sex, they don't use the word sex like the dictionary uses. When they say sex, they mean it's adultery or fornication or perversion. They can't talk clear that mush in the mouth. And they talk about gay, gays and things. Uh, gay is a homosexual. If you're a homosexual, you're not gay. Uh, that's right. Uh, if, you're, if you're a queer, you're miserable. And you've got a problem. And you better deal with your problem as a Christian. You're living in a day and age when there are all kinds of cover-ups and all kinds of ways of saying these things. And I've always been a very plain talker, and I'm going to talk real plain tonight. Now, sex is not a, a function. Sex is an attribute. That is, the thing is male or female. That's what sex is. Folks talk about having sex. Nobody has sex. That's trying to make a, 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 an action out of a word that's not a verb. And that's, that's the way the world does it. They, they use that thing and they use that thing so much that you fellows who fool with newspapers, radio, and magazines begin to talk like they talk and believe like they believe. Folks talk about sexuality. That's secrets. Sexuality. What's that? Nothing. Nothing. Now, the Bible covers all these things and covers them real clear, and we're going to talk about that tonight. I'm going to talk about it, first of all, because we're all men here, no ladies present, so we can talk plain. And the second thing is, I'm a plain talker and always have been. I can't stand professionalism, as you've probably gathered. Now, you know, when I was out in the world 27 years, I lived like any man lived. There are no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. And these sex things are thing any man is bothered with. You've got any red blood in you, the devil's on you all the time. And in the 20th century, it's much worse than it was. You go out that door and there are billboards out there on the highway that you couldn't have uh, printed in private magazines in 1930. And they're out there, you can see them. You go by a newsstand, they're all parts of the body exposed there in that newsstand, this playboy and plague girl and Genesis and all this mess there and penthouse and all that stuff. There's stuff out there for 10-year-old kids to look at that you couldn't have got in the United States without an act of Congress in 1920. It took an act of Congress to get Ulysses uh, available in the United States, written by James Joyce, about 1920. Get that book in. And that stuff now, that's tame. That's tame. Few fellows up against it. Now you get out in the world and you're always up against it. I remember 27 years out there in the infantry and dance bands and bartending. We are always looking for a woman. I mean, that's the big hunt. The old cat and dog game is you're trying to live in the sin without getting married. And she's trying to get married without living in the sin. That's all it is. Just a rat race. There's nothing in the world so overrated as sex. Nothing is so overrated as that. When you get right down to it, you know what it is? I mean, just right down to it, it's, it's a matter of conquest. That's all it is. It's just like winning a ball game. Guys meet right here and talk about it and say, did you score last night? Now, there's some truth in that. And the truth, that thing is, I remember a fellow said to me one time over in Tokyo Hotel, when you we were talking about the Japanese waitresses who were nice looking. And every woman looks good looking after you haven't been around one for four or five months. I mean, well, these guys my age go into bars and get drunk. Every woman there is a beauty cream. She may be just a fat old slob, man. An old drunk and a hag, you know. When a fellow's hard up, everything looks good. <laughs> well, that's right, brother. That's it. And you take, you take out in those old days for 27 years out there, we had some bad nights. I had problems, and my problem was the problem I have now. I've always had a hard time lying. So it's been difficult for me to lie. I was never a good gambler. I've been in crap shooting games and poker and stud and all this and that, but I was never a good gambler. As long as I was winning, I'd play. If I began to lose a little, I'd get out. I didn't like to lose a lot in the game. And the same way with, with out with the women, these guys I was with, they were big time operators. They'd always make out fine. They'd just tell a the woman they, they loved her, you know. That's what a woman wants to hear. Men fall in love with what they see. Women fall in love with what they hear. Now, that is New Testament, but that's as good as anything in the New Testament. <laughs> I mean, that's the truth. That's the truth. 
Some of the fellows back in the old days had the saying, they may not have been biblical, but brother, they were true. And that's one of them right there. And I never could do it. And it came to messing the woman up, I never could uh, lead her on like that. I mean, I love you. I almost laugh when I say it, you know. <laughs> uh, it's very difficult. <laughs> it's very difficult to get anywhere with that kind of an attitude. <laughs> so, so what I'd do is I'd wind up drunk. That's what I'd do. And, of course, a lot of guys like me. A lot of guys like me. But I was thinking, I was going across the street one day right after I got saved. I've been saved about two years. And I went back to a juke joint in Pensacola. Somebody just bought me a white Panama suit, about the third suit I ever had. And I was dressed up good and like a Christian should and had a bunch of tracks on my arm. And I was going back in this juke joint where I used to play a drum in a dance band to pass out tracks. And as I walked across the street, a bunch of girls came by in a car. This one I was about, though, about 29, about two years after I was saved. And when they went by, they whistled at me, and one of them poked her out the window and said, I'll take some of that, you know. And I walked across that street, and I thought to myself, yeah, you dirty blankety blank. And I was out there 27 years, you know, catting around and looking for something, having a hard time. Now I get dressed up and called to preach, and now, you, now I'm attractive. <laughs> Amen, brother. You bet your boot, man. And let me tell you, let me tell you, that's how it is. That's how it is. So when you guys get saved, or especially if you get saved and call the ministry, you're going to have to look out for that. But they think those people are going to be there. Now, I know what I'm talking about. I lived a single as a 12, single as a, a 12 years, a single man. My wife deserted me in 1960. Uh, and from 1960 to 1972, I lived as a single man and passed to the church. And you think it isn't a job passing a church as a single man, I was going to say you ought to try it, but don't try it. <laughs> you talk about fleeing youthful lust. I'm telling you, man, when, I, when my wife deserted me, I was 39 years old and had five children, and I didn't know anything about women. I mean, I, I really I did. I mean, I was raised with a drunken mother, like I told you, and my time with the infantry and then in, uh, in college, barracks, barroom, dormitories, I never lived in a house till I was 30 years old. I never been in a house. Dormitories, barracks, slip trenches, spot holes, closet huts. I never lived in a house. And I had a lot to learn about women. I mean, women to me were just, you know, I mean, just, you know, need food and water once in a while. <laughs> and uh, to me, to me, they weren't, to me, they weren't people, you know. <laughs> and... One of the greatest shocks in a man's life is when he marries a woman and finds out she's a person. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so I had a lot to learn, and I'm telling you, I thought, well, surely a fellow 39 years old with five children, nobody's going to be interested in him. Boy, did I have another guest coming. I'm telling you, they were doing everything but parachuting down the chimney, man. <laughs> <laughs> I have gone, you wouldn't believe it, I have gone out in the backyard and hid behind a tree at night. I mean, literally. I mean, literally. I mean, run out there and hide behind a tree. I have, I have literally been in the shower and turned the shower on and poked my head out the door and said, I'm taking a shower, and I had all my clothes on, wasn't taking a shower at all. I mean, to put the pressure on. Now, I don't know whether you have realized how much in the Bible has to deal with this thing. But when you get reading your Bible, and I'll give you some references here, and there won't be time to look them all up, but read them when you get time, I'll tell you what's in them. Write down 2 Corinthians 11, 1 to 4. And in 2 Corinthians 11, 1 to 4, you're told that the transaction that took place between Eve and Satan is described as seduction of a chaste virgin. 2 Corinthians 11, 1 to 4. That's why the Catholic Church has taught original sin is adultery. Now, I don't, I don't know that you can prove that one way or another. But some kind of transaction took place between Eve and the devil. I don't teach those things doctrinally to be so because there's not enough information where you can be sure you're ground. But uh, when she first got her first boy, she said, I've gotten a man of the, from the Lord. And First John chapter 2 says, Cain was of that wicked one. So I don't know what you got there, but you got something going on there. All right, then in Genesis 6, this thing doesn't, I mean, it gets off right in Genesis and goes right slap through. In Genesis 6, 1 to 4, the sons of God saw the daughters of men and came in unto them. 
it shows up again. It shows up in Genesis 3 and Genesis 6 before you get a running start. Element comes in there. And the element that comes in there is an attempt to corrupt seed. See, the Lord told Eve, I'm going to save the world by your seed. Uh, I'll take the, the woman's seed to bruise your head, the devil's head. So from right there to where you're sitting, what the devil is after is the seed. Well, the seed comes from procreation. The male has it. So that's where the attack is on that. All right, in Genesis 6 it shows up. Now write down Genesis 9. And in Genesis 9, not four chapters later, Ham goes in, commits sodomy with his father. And when he comes out of there, Noah curses Ham's seed, Canaan. He doesn't curse Ham. The reason why he doesn't curse Ham is because he blessed him. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, it said, The Lord blessed Noah and his sons. He couldn't reverse the blessing. So he, ble he cursed his son. Cursed would be Canaan, Ham's seed. And that thing had to do with sodomy, perversion of the seed. All right, Genesis 13. You write down Genesis 13. What happened to Genesis 13? Abraham goes down to Egypt, and he comes back with an African wife from Egypt, Hagar. You know what happened to her? From her come the Ishmaelites, the Arabs, and they've been fighting the Jews for 3,000 years. They're fighting over there right now. That's an attempt to destroy the seed. All right, write down Genesis 20. See, this is a... This a the thing is a biblical theme that goes clear through there, all the way through. In Genesis chapter 20, Lot winds up in a cave and his two daughters that have relationship with him, incest. So before you go on 20 chapters in that Bible, you've got a man going to bed with his father and a daughter going to bed with the father. You're not in there 20 chapters. If I don't all this sex perversion, incest that's coming up in America, it's not a new lifestyle. It's as old as the devil. But trying to make you think this is the new lifestyle. What's new about it? I'll take you by and return to Leviticus chapter 20. Why well, this stuff is, is it's as old as man. <clears throat> Leviticus 20, always trying to get you to think something new. But there's nothing new about this stuff. America, America is just filled with books about sex. And the idea seems to be you need to know something about it. Any fool can learn all he needs to know about sex from one magazine or one book. Every year, another bunch come out. The Kinsey Report, Rubin's book, all you know about sex. Some woman made one recently. And every five years, headlines, headlines, headlines. Why? Because it's a basic drive, so people are always interested in it. You always make money out of it. And the trick is to convince them there's something you haven't learned. There's a new technique. There's... There is nothing new under the sun. You know who has the largest population in the world? The people didn't have any books on sex for 3,000 years. <laughs> the Chinese. <laughs> you don't see Wong Fong Fong going around buying a sex book. I mean, they, they have the largest population in the world. They must know something about it. <laughs> down there in... Uh, down there in uh, those things... You have to be careful of those things. You know those that 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 sex drive, that is the strongest animal. It's an animal drive. Nothing spiritual about it. It's an animal instinct. That's the strongest instinct in your body besides self preservation. That's the second one. Now you're gonna play with that in the school and the kiddies? You're gonna play with that? Play with an animal instinct? Well that's the most dangerous thing you could possibly do. You take, uh, <clears throat> I got a friend down in uh, Orlando named Bobby Ware, and they put up a sex boutique down about two blocks from this church, and he picketed it. Now these guys got down there picket, and they called out the police on them, told they had to control the pickets, the three pickets. So they got down the three pickets and kept on, and finally a 19-year-old boy came to Brother Ware and said, I can shut that place down if you want me to. And Ware said, well, what are you going to do? He said, you just give me a free hand to do it, and I'll show you how to do it. And where I said, well, okay, but don't uh, connect yourself with the church. If there's something wrong, we can't help you. He said, no, just you say it's okay, I'll do it. I'll take the blame. So that guy went down, got him a big sign, put it on his car, both sides, and said, learn new sex techniques at the French boutique, name and address, and then drove all over town with that sign. He liked to cause a riot. 
on people threatening him, shaking the fists at him, cursing him, pulling the telephone, the city commissioners. They called Bobby Ware and told him what to do, and Ware said, I haven't got any control of him. Just let him go. They called the guy and threatened to throw him in jail. He said, you can't throw me in jail for advertising. <laughs> and he went all with that thing, and boy, I'm telling you about a week later, the manager of that French boutique was getting threatening calls to bomb the place, and people were shooting bullets through the window. I mean, he was... And he, and he came into Bobby Ware and sat down in front of him and said, Listen, he said, uh, he said, I've, uh, said I've, I've been thinking this thing over. And he said, uh, he said I've got to get saved. <laughs> and Ware led him to the Lord. When he got up of his knees, he said, Now, I suppose I'm saved. I suppose the next thing i got to do is close my store. <laughs> and Ware said, You got it right. You got it right. And he closed his store, and he had a chain of them. And he closed them down in Jacksonville, Orlando, and Tampa, and Fort Myers, and Miami. He closed down about six of them. So that's where they handle that. But see, he's trying to make them think there's something new. There's something new. There's nothing new. This country is so filled with material and sex. If a guy didn't know nothing, just a blind dummy, and got married, you know, he's going to have amateurs night, the first night of his wedding, he, he went, there isn't any reason, <laughs> There is there isn't any reason why he shouldn't he couldn't find out anything anybody knows in an hour. I mean the country is just soaked with the stuff. All right, Leviticus chapter twenty. Leviticus chapter twenty verse thirteen. If a man also lie with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed abomination, they should be put to death. Capital punishment for gays. Folks say, is it right? Well, you've got a mighty crooked God if it's right. The Lord said, kill him. The Lord's got funny ideas about right and wrong, doesn't he? All right, verse 15. If a man lie with a beast, he shall be surely put to death, and he shall slay the beast. Mess around with cows and sheep. Folks say people don't do that. Sure they do that. I was raised some in Kansas that told me about it. I guess the Kansas, Republican conservative Kansas, just about as dry and dead as you can get in the 1930s. That stuff was going on out there. And if a woman approached any beast and lie down there too, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. Folks, that kind of stuff that should go on. Well, down in the oil in the trip to World War I, that's why they ran them out of town. Down there in Canal Street and across there in the French Quarter, they ran them out of town. Those fellows took their music with them up the Mississippi and the Missouri to Kansas City and Chicago, and that's where you got modern music from. You got modern music from Bop, and you got it from Swing, you got it from... Uh, ragtime, you got it from uh, jazz, you got it from jazz in Dixieland, and it came out of the French Quarter in the Orleans where they pulled off that stuff all the time down there. And Lord didn't put that stuff in there because people don't do it, he put that stuff in there because people do do it. You say, what a terrible thing, but what's new, boys? What's new? I'll tell you what's new, nothing's new. There's nothing new under the sun. You say, how could people reach a level of degradation like that? Well, that's real simple. All you have to have is a college education. You can make it. I mean, figure it like this. Figure you were a, an amoeba, and a planaria, and a paramecium, and then a hydra, and then a jellyfish, and then a fish, and then a mammal, and then a monkey, and then a man, and you came up, and then you studied the thing, and find it doesn't work like they found it doesn't work. So say they couldn't have come up gradually. There had to be leaps or gaps in there where they jumped across the species because of 10,000 links missing. Therefore, when you get down here, you reach for the monkey's nearest thing to it. So there's a gap between the monkey and the man, and somebody or something must have helped get him across. So what is it? Somebody from outer space, perhaps? See? I mean, the more education you have, the dirtier you can get. And when you get that thing worked out, and these sons of God finally show up, they showed up in Genesis 6. They'll show up again, Revelation 12. Nothing like a Bible if they're at the science laboratory. And when they come down again, their pieces will be real simple. We did come down. We helped you cross the gap. Therefore, we're your saviors. We're your redeemers in the animal nature. Well, from outer space, we come to help you. Therefore, the process of procreation becomes the supreme act of creation that makes man his own god. Therefore, animals and human beings together would probably be an expression of worship. And folks say, oh no, such a thing couldn't be. Then how come it was all through the Old Testament God warned against it if it couldn't be? Those are part of the worship services. 
In Revelation chapter 2, he says in the, that Balak and Jezebel taught my servants to offer things to idols and to commit fornication. The sodomites and the fornication, the animal stuff, was part of the Sunday morning 11 o'clock service. And that's why God told him to kill him. You know why God said, come in there and kill him, slay man and woman, oxen, ox, fatling, the man, child, baby. What a terrible thing. Why kill the animals? Do you think about that? You read about David catching those chad horses and howling them, howling their hawks, cutting their hawks, crippling them. What's wrong with the horses? You ever read Deuteronomy chapter 17, 18? If you have set up the king, he's not to return to Egypt to get horses out of Egypt. What's wrong with the Egyptian horses, boy? When God drowned out Noah in the flood, how come he killed all the animals? They're all sinners too. Not like a Bible occur at a university. I always thought I was messing around right now, those amino acids and protein building blocks and nuclear acids and RA and DNA stuff and messed them out there trying to create stuff. You remember Star Wars? Here goes this thing across the stage there, it's a man. And right behind him is an animal man. And right behind him is a machine man. And right behind him is a machine. Somebody's evolving. They're messing up the genetics. You say, what's new? If you have a King James Bible, nothing. Absolutely nothing. No shocks, no surprises. What's King Kong doing? He's got a woman. What does the mummy man go after? A woman. What does Dracula go after? A woman. What does the wolf man go after? A woman. It's Beauty and the Beast. How does it wind up? Revelation 17. I saw a beast with seven heads, and a woman sat on him. All right, now, take your Bible and turn to Zechariah. If you have a King James, you're always ahead of any psychiatrist in the world, or any psychologist, or any scientist. It's too bad they don't have any brain, but that's the way the Lord made them. All right, Zechariah chapter 5 in one hand, Revelation chapter 17 in the other. Now, the thing that makes this so oppressive is the fact that evidently in the air, the spiritual principalities and powers up in the air, evidently three of them at least are female. Now, I showed you something on, uh, on uh, Santa Claus the other night about that hermaphrodite business and about that sphinx. And there's something to that. I, I don't know exactly what it is, but there's something to it. And when you pick up Zechariah and Revelation, you find this. Zechariah chapter 5, verse 9. Then lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they picked this thing up and take it to Babylon, verse 11, in the land of Shinar. All right, Revelation 17. Here's Babylon in the land of Shinar. Revelation 17, verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit of the wilderness, and I saw a woman, a woman. So at least three of those principalities and powers, those demoniac forces, are female. Hence the Catholic Church is always talking about a queen of heaven, and made Mary the queen of heaven. They have one of those ancient religions had a male deity and a female deity. They're called Baal and Ashtoreth in Judges 2.13. Baal and Ashtoreth. Baal the sun god, Ashtoreth is the moon goddess. So, sex set up. And sometimes that female deity is called Ishtar, Astarte, sometimes she's called Venus, Diana, sometimes she's called the Ale Woman in Norwegian, she's the Lorelei in, uh, in Germany, and she's always, she always has blonde hair when you find her. And it symbolizes a member, sort of glow around the head. You've got some kind of electronic thing. I don't understand all this. I don't teach it doctrinally because I don't know enough about it. But you've got some kind of spiritual principality that is female. And when the devil will show up, he will show up with a consort, a female consort. And that woman will typify those female principalities and powers. Now, those things which were strong in the Dark Ages of the old demonology fellows used to talk about succubuses and incubuses. An incubus and a succubus were two night demons that 
roamed around, and one of them seduced men, one of them seduced women. Now, how much of that is just nightmares or wet dreams or God knows what, nobody knows. But sure as the world, the stuff is in the air. It's in the air. Johnny Todd made a lot of good living pretending to be a witch. He might have been. I mean, if they come a dime a dozen these days. And he got up and all he did was go all over America and shock Christians with some material that is all in one book any fool can buy for $15. You get the, the encyclopedia of demonology and witchcraft and you have everything that Johnny Todd ever knew in his life. It's in one book. But Christians don't fool with those books. Now I fool with them. Maybe I'm not supposed to, but uh, me and the devil are in close fellowship for years and years. I'm kind of used to that, to the climate, so to speak. And uh, I wouldn't advise you to mess with that some of the stuff. It might be too no novel and new to you. It doesn't shock me. I guess you, I guess you get kind of hard. Now, in Romans, about you, it says, I would have you be simple concerning that which is evil. God doesn't want you to know all those things. You're not missing something by not knowing them. In Revelation chapter 2, it says, To many as have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I lay no other burden on them. So I'm going to be real brief on what I'm going to say right at this point. I'm not going to take you into all the gory details of this stuff. You don't have to know about the gory details. Be simple concerning that because evil. But sin works like this. I mean, I know the depths of Satan as I speak. Sin works like this. And it does, if, if, if it's, if it's Faggots, if it's cigarettes, if it's uh, reefers, if it's tobacco, or if it's dope or cocaine or heroin, or if it's alcohol, or if it's women, it's the same process. We'll take, uh, we'll take the liquor. The guy drinks a mixed drink at a bar, cocktail, not very strong, tastes good. Takes two or three of them and gets drunk. Comes back if he got the money, gets six, four or five to get drunk. Can no longer get drunk, and it's about six or eight of them. Cost a lot of money, six or eight of them cocktails. The guys get him some brandy, apricot brandy. Tastes good. Shouldn't do tough. Tastes good. Drinks it. Gets drunk off a bottle. Person doesn't turn him on. Gets him some uh, bourbon. Straight. Can't take a spice of coke with it. Person is taking it straight. Isn't strong enough. You want more. You want more. You want more. You want more. Person. When I, when I got saved, I could drink a case of beer in 12 hours by myself. The case, 24 cans by myself. Used to get drunk on two cans. By the time I've been in the army four years, eight cans wouldn't even give you a light. <laughs> and you get going like that, those fellas get to around and take the marijuana. Pretty good stuff. It isn't strong. You get into cocaine. You get into heroin. Pretty soon you're pumping. And pretty soon, I gotta have more. I gotta have more. I gotta have more. I, it won't turn you on. Now that's the way sex is. Gentlemen, all that a preoccupation with sex ever led to was a preoccupation with sex. What you have to do with that phonograph gets run your head, you have to cut it. After things run for a while, you have to just take the needle off the record. Because it, it just develops itself. Now the end of that thing is, Normal sex acts turn the fellow on. Then that isn't enough. And it's deviant sex acts, which are not counted as perversion, but deviation. Then it's perverted sex acts, and that isn't enough. And pretty soon it's self-mutilation and self-abuse. Sadism, masochism, turn them on. And then that wears out. And gentlemen, you wouldn't believe it, but the final, the final, the final act, the final curtain is when you get the place where the only thing that turns you on sexually is hearing somebody screaming while they're being tortured. And a fellow says, well, I would just never get that low. Well, I'll tell you, gentlemen, every one of us has that nature in us. And in a Christian, I'll guarantee you that nature is really put down, praise the Lord. And the Holy Spirit really has him mashed down, thank God. So it's not liable to happen, praise the Lord, see, but it's there, it's there. You ever one of those guys like Carell and Manson who have to torture people before they abuse the dead bodies, or abuse them and then torture them? It turns them on. 
And that thing is the bottom. Now, how do you know that's the bottom? Because when the devil gets out in the lake of fire, you know all he's got when he gets out in the lake of fire? It says in Ezekiel, Pharaoh shall be comforted for all his multitude. Talking about the devil. You know what the devil's blessing is? And time you think about joking about the devil and taking him lightly. You know what the devil's final reward is? The only thing he's got when he gets through what he's doing? He has the privilege of hearing millions of people scream forever whom he ruined. And that's his, that's his reward. That's the bottom. Now, we're all susceptible to these things. Uh, write out some references here, which you won't have time to, to go into, but you can look at them when you get time. For women, for women, Ezekiel 16 and Ezekiel 23. Ezekiel 16, Ezekiel 23. For men, Proverbs chapter 1 to 7. Proverbs 1 to 7. That's some of the roughest scripture you ever read in your life. Proverbs 1 to 7. Romans 1, which is on lesbians and homosexuals. Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians 7, which is on marriage, divorce, separation, and chastity, and continence, and lust, and this and that. Now, there's much more in the Bible about it, but those are the main parts. And like I said, gays are not gay. I've known queers. Anybody in the army has been throwing with them. I came up like a toad. I wasn't raised. I was drug up. I came like an alley cat. I don't. I, I came home for meals and sleep, and that was about it. And sometimes I wasn't asleep. I used to crawl out of the window of my house in the peak of Kansas at 12 o'clock at night and go down and put my dad's car in neutral and push it halfway down the block so he couldn't hear me at couldn't hear it start when the you know, cars came by, and then I'd crank that thing up and drive out five miles outside of town to a pump. I knew the guy couldn't lock up. I'd just pump me a full tank and be gone at four in the morning. Boy, I'll never forget one night they caught me. You talk about getting caught, man. I was coming back from Kansas City, Missouri. That was a wet state, and Kansas was dry. I mean, I had bootleg liquor in the car. Federal offense. I was in a stolen car crossing the state line. Federal offense. And I had two girls in that car 15 years old. Statutory kidnapping. I mean, you talk about the book. Boy, I had the book on me. And I was coming back there one night about 2 o'clock in the morning. And my dad, in the meantime, had woken up at night and checked the car and found the car was gone, reported to the sheriff, and they'd report the highway patrol. I was coming down that road, and let me tell you, man, the stars at night are big and bright, deep in the heart of Kansas. <laughs> back there, boy. And with Sabaka talk about missing that sound, I don't miss that sound, man. <laughs> you live the life I live, you don't like to hear that sound anytime. I mean, I've been, I've been living straight for 32 years, I still don't like to hear it. I've had, I've had those cops catch me going up the side of a building, caught between a chimney and the side of the building, boy, I mean, with a gun home and everything else. I hear that thing going like that, man, I get, I get cold blood. Come back like that, through there coming after me like that back in those old days, we got in all kinds of trouble and we got into trouble deep. We got in trouble hard. And come up that way, I came up like a dog. My first experience with homosexual was in a theater. And I was in there about 10 years old, sitting down there with my short pants on. Some fellow about 40 years old came in and sat down next to me. He reached out there in the dark, ran his hand down my, my knee. And, uh, you know, I just like an animal. I had, I had instinct. And I just stood straight up in that theater and yelled, oh, yeah! <laughs> and that guy took off like a scalded dog, man. I remember one time I was in a hospital in, uh, in Tuscaloosa, and an old boy came there. I was drawing pictures. He was an artist. And I, you know, he was pretty tooty. You could tell that when he came in. And he'd come and watch me paint and draw. One day he said to me, he said, you know, your stomach muscles just attract me so much, you know. <laughs> And I said, uh, okay, sonny, I said, I'll tell you what. I said, you sit right in that chair where you're sitting, and you make one move toward this bed, and you see that window there? He said, yes. I said, you're going right out the window head first. And if you think I'm bluffing, just try it. So he backed off. And I've had maybe four or five other encounters like that with, with that kind of thing. And they're not gay, they're miserable. Gentlemen, the three greatest killers in this century were all homosexuals. Carell, Manson, and old Amin over in Africa. 
My boy was a homosexual and killed more of his people than I've been killed in the United States in a hundred years. Every one of them was a queer. I bet you when they find that fellow been killing all those colored kids up in Atlanta, Georgia, I bet that fellow be just as queer as a three dollar bill. Now folks say, well, God loves queers too. Yes, he does. But the trouble with queers, they justify the sins. They alibi them. Now if you got that trouble, I mean, maybe some fellow's got that trouble. I'm not saying you can't be saved like a lot of the brethren say, and I'm not saying that you're not saved like some of the brethren say. But I'm saying if you've got that trouble, there's some things you better have to do. You better have to justify that thing. You better have to make alibis for it. You better confess it. You better judge it. You better repent of it. And you better do your dead level best to quit it. And you're in trouble. Just like any other sin. Just like any other sin. Now, on this sin business, just a few illustrations. Uh, how dangerous it is. Uh, we had a fellow down there in Alabama one time, messing around, stepping out in his wife. And she's having a baby, and he was stepping down there all the time she was in the hospital. One night after he left the hospital, he's driving down the street. And he sits somebody head on, and that steering wheel broke off. That's about 1940. And that shaft went right between his legs. And they finished operating on him. He didn't have to worry about stepping on his wife anymore. Now, that may not happen if a fellow steps out on his wife, but it can happen. And if you're a child of God, the Lord is going to be a lot more careful with you than he is unsaved people. The fellow gets in combat, that's the part of his body he's always worried about. I mean, oh God, don't let me get hit there. I mean, you run along the rifle butt across the front of it. We call it, us old DIs call it the family jewel. You know, we've got to, <laughs> to hit the guy in the family jewels. It's a kind of rough expression, but that was the expression. You take him, I've seen the sin get a hold of a fella, and the sex get a hold of a fella so bad, couldn't do anything. I've seen him hang on to the, you know, the pipes from the tree and the streams, turn blue in the face, man, get that stuff. Before we left the Philippines, I was back in the jungle there, and I was living there like the rest of them. And I remember I left the jungle one time, and I saw an old white boy, head poking out of those swally huts back there in the jungle, some GI, AWL, then run the military police for about three months. Had a beard on, bloodshot eyes, hanging out the window. I knew the guy. Every time the MPs come back, they'd try to find him, the, the girl that hide him. You know what that fellow was doing? That fellow was dying of syphilis. And that fellow had open sores on him, man. I mean, raw, bleeding sores. And he couldn't quit. He couldn't quit. Now, the, the, the danger of that thing, see, is it's like liquor. Like I was telling you last night, and money, it'll get you. And it'll get you, it'll get you good. That old man was dying one time, and I had to have four or five people hold him down there in the bed. He's screaming, trying to get the nurse to get in bed with him, calling out all the women he'd gone to bed with. That's a terrible way to die, you know. But, you know, the trouble is, all that sin, it makes an impress to your mind, it's like a phonograph record. And it keeps spinning and spinning, and after a while it gets stuck in the groove, and then keeps on going. Now, I've been through that. I've been out there 27 years. And I'm one of these characters, which you probably know, but I've been hearing me for years. I'm one of these intense characters that when I get into something, I'm always, I'm always committed 100%. There's any withdrawal anywhere. It's always all the way in whole heart. And being an artist, I'm much more sensitive than a lot of fellows are. I get a lot more out of anything than most people do. I'm even a meal. Or walking across the street. And you'd have to be artistic to understand that. I know the Lord put a joke when he put an artist's soul in me. I look like a ditch digger, you know, I don't look like an artist. <laughs> Lord put a joke when he made me. He put together the strangest character you ever saw in your life. I don't have fingers like an artist. I mean, they're just blunt, you know. But I, shadows affect me. I'm affected by perspective. Uh, I go in homes and the pictures bother me on the walls. The hung too low. All the interior decorators hang the pictures down. I guess they think you're supposed to be touching the couch or the chair when you sit down. <laughs> uh, a picture is supposed to be where you see it at eye level when you stand. Well, now, what is what am I, an old roughneck like me, what am I doing worried about interior decorating? Well, I don't know, but that's just where I am. <laughs> and and stuff, sounds affect me. I mean, they, 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 they get a hold of me. If I get a good meal, I get more of a good meal than some of you guys get out of a hundred dollar raise. I mean, I taste good fried chicken with fried okra and tomatoes and pepper sauce 
and or fresh fried uh, trout with yellow rice and soy sauce, and I'm just I'm I'm just in a it's an orgy. <laughs> I'm, I, I mean that's right, but I get something out of it. And because of that, because of that, but the way I've lived, I've probably lived as much in <clears throat> in one year as most fellows do in ten. So back in those twenty-seven years, I actually ran probably about a fifty-four-year course. <laughs> and taking over, God knows I was, I looked fifty-four years old when I was saved, brother. God knows that. You ought to see the pictures. And being an artist, uh, I'm open to pictures. Now, some of you fellows are real blessed in that you don't have much imagination. <laughs> Amen. One of my friends down in Mobile said, uh, he said, if the ignorance is bliss, I'm a blizzard. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't have an imagination, you save yourself a lot of trouble. Because you can't sin unless you think about it. And you can't think about it unless you've got pictures to think with, and you can't get the picture unless you see them somewhere. Now, I manufacture them. But as I look at a blank wall and project on that wall anything you can name, doesn't make any difference. I mean, as fast as you could talk, I could put the picture on the wall. So I've had great struggles with sin, great agony with sin. I've been through some trial, man, I'll kid you not. And that's why I keep saying the best time to get saved when you're young, before you form that stuff. The older you get, the worse it gets, because you form habits. You form mental habits, mental pictures. And some of you fellows are going to have to fight against this stuff all your life. It's going to be like a bear clinging in your back, boy. It's going to be a fight. And I'm going to tell you something. You're going to have to fight. You're not going to be able to rest in this passive resistance. You're going to have to fight. You take, uh, I'll tell you something else. The keener mind you have, the more trouble you're going to have. If you've got a good mind, you're going to have to keep your mind busy. Folks, I don't know why I taught myself the tuba and taught myself the guitar and taught myself the harmonica and I'm working on a violin right now and taught myself German and teach Hebrew and Greek and paint and write books. Stay busy. Stay busy. Stay out of trouble. Does that old mind a neutral and put us in that thing and go right back and get right back in that mess you were in before? Bible says fools make a mock of sin. Well, some things about it are funny, but it's not funny later. The trouble is you get to the bottom of the cup, see? The, 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 you have to unload the boat. You know what I mean? There's some things that are funny. I, I've been the funniest things I've ever heard in my life. It happened to a friend of mine. I, looking back over now, I know if I was in his shoes, I'd been terrified. But, you know, that's how jokes are. I mean, you know, Brother brother Modish made a mistake on his message and said the disciples had gathered together to break, and then he said the wrong word and said what he should have said. Well, the ha-ha-ha, big joke, you know. <laughs> Isn't so funny if you make it, you know. But I had a fellow. <laughs> yeah. But that's human nature. I mean, human nature. Just me first, you next. Happen to you. <laughs> Happen to me. <laughs> and this, this friend of mine, he was messing around with some guy's wife. And I mean, he went to her house and they were back there in the bedroom. And boy, about that time he came home and he wasn't supposed to come home. He's supposed to be out of town. And there wasn't time to get him out of there. And she put him in the closet and closed the door. And that guy came in. And she tried for 30 minutes to talk him and going down the corner for a cup of coffee or a hamburger or something. Like, I'm tired. I'm going to bed. <laughs> and, so, and twice he went for the closet to get something. And she had to talk him out of it and get him over the bathroom someplace else. <laughs> and they got in bed. And that friend of mine stayed in that closet until 7 in the morning. <laughs> I mean, he just stood in that closet, unable to move, and just sweated for 12 hours. <laughs> I, I think that guy probably is more careful after that. <laughs> but the thing is, the Bible says, the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. And if it doesn't find you out one The Philistine king, when he came back and said, I've been going against the Amalekites and, the, and been killing Philistines. I mean, all that kind of stuff. He had, had four wives, took another guy's wife after he sent her back. But the Lord ain't held that one thing against him. Now, you know why that was? When God got a hold of David through Nathan, he said, The Lord said, I've given you your master Saul's wives and his riches and his house and this and that. And if that hadn't been enough, I'd have given you such and such things you required. 
Now, David's sin was there wasn't a real need. He already had four wives. And the Lord told him, if you would need any more, I'd have done that. You know what David was like? He was like a rich man that got good food, goes next door and steals a loaf of bread from a poor man. That's what it was. And that's why the Lord held it against him. Now, that's a warning. And that warning is, if my God shall supply your need through its risen and glory by Christ Jesus, and he will, then you make sure you do all you can to supply your need properly. And when your need is met, then don't get hoggish. Don't want the lion to share when your need is met. Now, sometimes your need is not met. I'll be right frank. I've been for years fighting that thing. My God, the thought you need. Well, where is it, Lord? <laughs> I mean, no wife there. And pray and pray and pray and pray. Nothing, 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 nothing. But sometimes the Lord doesn't do everything like, like, right like we want him to do when he wants us to do it. But if you're really hard up and things are bad and things are really tough and you'll be driven by the devil and driven to sin, then you've got to remember something. You've got to remember, my God, to supply all your need, and there's a right way to get that need supplied. Otherwise, you don't really need it. Now, that's hard to swallow sometimes. I mean, we tell ourselves, well, I really do, and the Lord knows better. No, we really don't. We try to make God think we need everything we want. My kids say, Daddy, I want an ice cream cone. I want some ice cream. I want some ice cream. And they get to be about six, and they say, Daddy, we need some ice cream. Did you ever notice that? Oh, they are. Down there in Panama City, Florida, I talked to the guy one time. He was a... Uh, church member and his wife was stepping on him with a naval cadet, air cadet. And finally one night he said to me, he said, uh, I've gotten things right. I've given him my cigarettes. I'm saved. My wife is saved. I'm a distraction of what I'm going to do. She's going out with a guy again tonight. And he said, what am I going to do? I said, take you do. I said, uh, go home and pray. He said, well, she gets in bed with me about 10 o'clock. Then about 1130, she gets up and goes out. I said, okay, tonight in bed, you get in bed at 10 o'clock. And at about 10, 15, you slip out of the bed and go in the living room, get on your knees and stay there until she comes back. And he did it. And he got up and got out of the bed, went in the living room that night, got on his knees, and about 11.30, she got up and came to the living room, had to turn the light for something, and saw him kneeling there, and was shocked to death, and then finally laughed and said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm praying. And she said, praying? About what? And he said, about you. And she said, well, you're wasting your time, went out the door. He prayed one hour, and at the end of an hour, that woman came back in the, into the room there, looking like she'd been through Custer's last stand. And she came with her dress torn and mud all over her feet, and a, a lily pad still stuck to her hair, and soaking wet from head to foot. And that woman had gone out, and some guys had seen her and chased her in the car and tried to drive her off the road to get her. And she got out and run for a life through a bunch of blocks there, and fall in some of this fish pond, and then come back. So sometimes you get results like that, but you take, <laughs> you take, I know, I know a couple down there with the guy's wife was stepping on him like that, and with one of those guys down in the Naval Air Station, a lot of that stuff going on down there, you know, Eglin Field and Berkeley and the Naval Air Station, and he got praying, that woman didn't get right, she's singing in the choir, Christian, wouldn't get right, wouldn't get right, he kept praying, and boy, one day after about two months, bam, man over that city, 2,000 feet over that sea, something like a shock wave, and they picked up 25 pounds of that guy's body. I mean, they look up at 25 pounds of it, they didn't get the rest of it. And they put that stuff in a box and sent it out to California for a funeral, and that guy's wife rode all the way back to California next to the boxcar, clothes in black, riding back with those 25 pounds, what was left of her lover. And that woman was a professing Christian who sang in a choir in a fundamental independent premillennial missionary Baptist church of demons. <laughs> All right, now we're going to close here. In closing, I'm going to tell you something a little bit about control. And there has, you have, there has to be fight. There has to be control. Now, I'll tell you what I've found. Maybe what i found won't work for you, but I hope it will. Turn to Numbers 3352. Numbers 3352. Again, in the other Bibles, you won't find this verse like it's written. You're going to have a King James Bible to have this. 
Numbers 33, Numbers 33, 52. Now these are instructions for coming into the land of Canaan, what they're to do when they come in. And it says, Numbers 33, 52, Then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, and destroy all their what? Pictures. Lord, consider that thing to be of prime importance in getting rid of false gods. Pictures. Now, gentlemen, that's what's so terrible about TV. Christ says in Matthew 6, 22, the light of the body is the eye. If the eye is evil, the body is full of darkness. And the danger about that thing is that thing plants pictures in your mind. And there is any way you can avoid it. I mean, you just watch the football game or the baseball games. What was the beer ad in between? Well, what's the beer ad? Well, some half-dressed woman switching around serving beer, some half-dressed woman holding up the beer, some half-dressed woman dancing with the ad. You're not going to get free from it, no matter what you do. And it's going to be around. It's going to be around. When I'm out in a meeting in a, in a hotel room, I turn on TV once in a while. I turn it uh, for two, re- two things. I turn it to monitor. I'll go across there and catch this and flip, and flip, and flip, and flip, and then put that stuff in a sermon used for some odd material. Preached against it. And the next thing, as I must confess, one sin I've never mastered, uh, I could never resist watching a prize fight or a hockey game. Those two things. And I thank God I don't have a television in my home. I don't have one in my house. Of course, if I did, I'd spend time with it. <laughs> so the best thing to do is get the junk out of your home, then if you have to run to someplace else, well, okay, but you're not going to have it in your home, you're going to take up your time. I mean, redeem the time. I, I could never resist a hockey game or a, or a prize fight. I like to watch that. Like a fellow said, he, he went to a prize fight and a hockey game broke out. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know why I like to watch that hockey game? Because it's genuine. Those fights are real, man. They're real. Those are tempers. Those are tempers. Nothing staged about that. You're not getting to catch it for blood and those things. <laughs> If anybody gets the teeth knocked on the floor, they're not official, boy. They were knocked out, man. I and mean, they were knocked out. I never could resist that kind of thing. But you take that thing, you can't even watch a hockey game without getting exposed from that junk. Now, there are two philosophies on this, gentlemen. One philosophy is the old philosophy. The old philosophy is you can't be perfect, but try to be. You're sinful, but keep your sins at a minimum. You can't be completely holy, but keep the bit and bridle on. That's the old philosophy. You're born no good, so keep the flesh down. So that's the old philosophy. The old philosophy is you're no good, it'll take all you can to keep yourself in control, so if you're going to drink liquor, smuggle it in the paper sack where nobody can see it. See, I'm, I'm not talking about Christianity, I'm talking about philosophy, see? The old philosophy is the flesh is no good, control it, keep it down, make it behave as much as you can. Now, that old philosophy, gentlemen, is Christian philosophy. I didn't say it was scripture, but it's, it's, a, it's Christian philosophy. That's how you look at it. Now, the new philosophy is, you're going to anyway. Go ahead. Everybody else does it. Help yourself. Values have changed. Don't let your conscience bother you. You're expressing yourself. Then it's your own way of doing things. You got your thing. I got my thing. Do your thing. The kid's born good. Let the little baby express himself. Then kick out the windows and bust the light bulbs and paint up the car and have himself a ball in the sweet little kid. That's the new philosophy. And the new philosophy is not a Christian philosophy. All right, now because that thing of the eye, I, I find this. I find one of the best ways to keep this thing in check is spend as much time out of doors as you can. You say, well, out of doors you'll see things. Yes, you will. But it isn't like being in a room. Now, you check back and think about all the time that you messed up. Take something like masturbation, something like that. Or every time you started to go in that direction. Wasn't it indoor someplace? You say, no, it wasn't. Okay, how many times outdoors compared with indoors? There's something about walls and buildings. It's, it's just, when God made Adam and Eve, he put them in a garden. He put them outdoors. And if you want to get picked over these kind of things, I'd advise you to spend all the time you can outdoors if there's any way to do it. You say, well, down the beach you see all kinds of things. Yeah, but, but did you know the stuff doesn't work on you to get back to the motel? Did you ever notice that? 
There's something about there's something about walking through woods or walking up mountains or lying under trees or looking at stars or looking at clouds that gets the mind off those things. Now maybe you never found that to be so, but I found it to be so. And the same way with sports. Uh, you're not really bothered with problems like that when you're trying to figure out how to steal second. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm no sports fanatic. I'm not saying you ought to be, you know, Bronco and McGursty, you know, and the Decapo and all this and that. But some of you guys need to eat some raw meat. <laughs> and did you know when you're playing golf, I mean, that doesn't look like much of a game. The fellow says, well, you know, just hit a ball and walk after it. You'd be surprised how hard it is to hit that ball. <laughs> and did you know when you're out there trying to figure what iron to use and how to hit that thing, the stuff I'm talking about does not enter your mind. You say, well, the woman out there in the, on the golf course in their shorts, yeah, you see that sometimes. And some guy makes some unsafe fun and makes some dirty crack about it and this and that. But the next time you drive, you're on the tee and the grip, man. You're on the tee and the grip. You better have me. <laughs> Ball go across three other fairways. <laughs> and, and, the same, and the same thing goes with fishing. When you're out there fishing and casting with a fly rod and trying to get up under a bush, the stuff is not in your mind. So outdoors is a good thing. All right, the next thing, of course, is the Bible. Psalm 199. Psalm 199. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? Christ has sanctified them with the truth. Thy word is true. Christ says, now you are clean through the word that I have spoken to you. There's something about exposure to this book that, that, that tends to repress that stuff. There's an old saying, my sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from my sin. And it's true. The more time you spend in that, the more you seem to store up in something in you an antidote. It's a counterbalance. Now the stuff's still there. You'll still be tempted. There'll still be hard times. You may even fail. But boy, it won't be the percentage it'll be if you leave that book on the shelf. All right, the next thing is prayer. And every, every man should know by heart 1 Corinthians 10, 13. If you can't even memorize John 3, 16, you need to memorize 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says there's no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. We all get thinking we're different, don't we? We're not the least bit different. We're just all Adamic. I mean, you come in a room, you worry about what people are thinking about you. Don't worry about it. They're not thinking about you at all. They're worrying what you're thinking about them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's how people are, you know. And we're all tempted. You take a, a real good-looking woman walks in there half-dressed, you know, bouncing, waving everything around. Every man in the building looks. It's just automatic, you know. You may not think anything, but your head just turns. <laughs> oh yeah, man. Yeah. And uh, sometimes it's a good idea to practice on a thing like that, get some practice, and that kind of thing happens in a restaurant or a business office or a bus or a street car, just to deliberately look away some other way. Just do it deliberately, just for pure spite. <laughs> but that stuff is there. Now why is that stuff there? It's instinct. It's instinct. It's not something you joke about. Oh, God knows how many jokes are made about it. All the comedians joke about it. But my land, man, you're dealing with an animal instinct that's so strong, it'll destroy your church, your school, your family, your health, and your life. You don't joke about a thing like that. That thing ain't funny. All right, now about prayer. There's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Now, we're not. God is faithful. Now, listen who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. He won't put along where you can't stand it, but will with the temptation, now this is the catch, provide a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Now the problem is the escape hatch the Lord chooses may not be the one you want to choose. I mean, the guy's up against it all the time, says, Lord, get me out of it, Lord, get me out of it, and the Lord opens the door, and that isn't the door you want it open or the one you expect it to be open. But when the thing attacks and begins to come on you like that, the thing to do is say, Lord, I need out of this mess. I'm going to get in a mess here if I'm not careful. Now, Lord, get me out. Get me out. Get me out. I'm in a mess. Paul said it's better to marry than to burn. 
All right, if it's better to marry than to burn, then maybe you, some of you are burning, maybe you better pray and ask God to get you a wife. You say, well, people say this and people say that, and you know, well, the only prospect now doesn't look too good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, man, yeah, that's how it goes. But then don't complain and tell God the need isn't met if God's met the need. See? There's so much of just physical things about marriage. You know, Paul said it's better for man to marry than burn. He puts it on the physical basis altogether. I was telling Pete the other day, and he, I mean, we know there's more to it than that. I mean, the instruction how man and wife ought to treat each other after save, but the motive for getting married is a pretty physical thing. I mean, it's attraction. But if there's no attraction, you're not going to have any kind of marriage anyway. Pete asked the other day, he asked about these things, about sowing the flesh and reaping the flesh and this and that, and he said, well, what about overeating? I said, well, you reap what you sow, corruption. And he said, well, isn't eating sowing to the flesh? I said, yeah, it is. He said, well, what about, what about just eating? <laughs> Which is a good question. You know what eating and drinking is? Sowing to the flesh. But it's legitimate sowing. See? You have to make a distinction between what's legitimate and what's illegitimate. And one day your ship will come home and stand down at the harbor. You ever stop thinking why most men over 40 are conservatives? Folks, if you get old, you can't operate anymore. That isn't true. That isn't true. I can outrun my wife right now any day of the week. And out player and out of other things. Fellas, that guy 65 who could, they could, they could put on a dance there, or drive some of you fellows to the hospital bed. You take, you take my bunch, boy, we dance, we throw them down and thin the legs and put them up over her head, man, that jitterbug stuff. You had to, you had to have muscles to dance in those days. <laughs> Looks like you're trying a woman out of a burning building. And it isn't, and it isn't, it, it isn't like that. You know why most men over 40 are conservative? Because they've had time to see the results of their youth. See? Now you're 17, 18, or 19, 20, you're bold and brave. I know the same way myself, you know, you don't age with it, you don't blame, do what you want to do. <laughs> then you get to be about 30 or 35 and the ships start coming in. And the Lord says, hey son, you got a ship down there at Pier 5, go down and unload. And I go down there and lift up that hatch and look in there and my God, man, I mean, coffee ground, eggshells, dead cats, you know, and all this stuff in there. And I said, I can't unload that. <laughs> the Lord says, you send it out, you, you, you clean it up. I said, this couldn't be my ship. It didn't have that much on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just saw that ear of corn that Brother Sabaka showed the other night, didn't you? You see what came from one of them? Well, what a man sold to reap. So I go down there to the pier and I stop one of my buddies. And I said, I need some help in unloading the ship up here. I'll help me unload this thing. And he said, man, I can't help you. I got one of my own down here. <laughs> That's what goes on. And that's why the older you get, the more you talk about these things and warn about these things. It isn't like, I see, I'm not here, it isn't Mr. Killjoy talking to you. And trying to scare you out of a good time and put the warning on you and scare you to death so you can't move and make life, it isn't like that. It's like uh, me telling you ahead of time to keep the thing down and keep the harness on it and the bit and the bridle and get help from God so you don't have a tragedy before you get through. That's what it's like. All right, now Proverbs 16.3 is the final thing. And Proverbs 16.3 is a great verse in the Bible on how to control your thoughts so they don't get away from you. Proverbs 16.3. Proverbs 3.16, I guess, says, Commit thy, no, trust in the Lord with all thy heart, you know, and commit thy works, for, uh, commit uh, all thy way, trust him, you know, something, and he'll direct thy paths. But Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. That's the verse. Proverbs 16, 3. Young people say, well, I just can't control my thinking. You'll have to control your thinking. You haven't got any choice. man said one time, he said, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. So a character, reap a destiny. Your destiny is determined by your character. Your character is determined by your habits. Your habits are determined by your actions. Your actions are determined by your thoughts. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Commit thy works to the Lord, and thy thoughts 
shall be established. So what we have to do as men, Christian men, we have to get in the habit of taking everything we're doing and turning it over to the Lord for blessing. Commit thy works on the Lord. And I'll be just as general as I can be. Uh, brethren, if what you do in the bedroom and what you do in the bathroom, I mean, no, no holes barred, no, no, no false modesty. I mean, we're, we're naked before the Lord. All things are naked and open before the eyes of them with whom we have to do. If what you do in the bedroom and the bathroom and the automobile and the living room and the parlor and the kitchen and the church and the school and the factory and the barracks and the dormitory and the drill field and the locker room and the drill field and the playing field is turned over to the Lord. When you do it, he'll establish your thoughts so they don't run them up and get you in trouble. All right, brother. That's all. Nothing like a Bible to clear up the college education.